All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Avignano Show, Global Elections, Part 3. Today, we're going to be talking about Lithuania, a Baltic country of 2.8 million people with a rich history and great people. I highly recommend all of you to visit. It's a great place, um, even if I've never been. But I have many friends from there, and they say it's a great place. So definitely go. Um, anyway, they have a presidential election coming up on May 12th, and potentially a second round on May 26th, if neither candidate receives an absolute majority of 50% in the first round. The second round, of course, would be between just two candidates. Um, the, t the three leading candidates, and the ones I'm going to be mainly talking about today, are frontrunner and current president, Gitanas Nociada, who is the incumbent, polling at around 35 to 40%. Then the current prime minister, Ingreta Shimonita, is polling at 9 to 10%. And she is socially the most liberal of the candidates, uh, being the most supportive of LGBTQ rights and abortion rights. Um, and her main voting base is with young, urban, progressive voters. And then finally, on the flip side, you have Ignis Vegele, Ignis Vegele, who is polling at 10 to 11 percent. Um, and he is the most traditional, most socially conservative candidate. And he appeals largely with more rural, older voters. Um, okay. Now, uh, now that you have those three candidates, I think it's important to turn to a brief overview of the presidential powers because Lithuania is a semi-presidential system where the president has more power than parliamentary systems like the other Baltic countries or like Northern Macedonia in the last video, but they have uh, less power than full presidential systems like the US or Panama. That was the first video I did. Um, okay, so here are the presidential, a few of the presidential powers that I have taken from the constitution. Um, again, I'm sorry if I'm looking down. Much of this video, I may be reading off paper uh, because there's a lot of information that I don't want to miss. So I apologize in advance if I'm looking down at this paper. But anyway, getting into it. Um, so number one, the president decides the basic issues of foreign policy and conducts Lithuania's, Lithuanians' foreign policy. He signs tr international treaties upon ratification of SEMAS, which is the parliament. Um, he appoints the prime minister upon SEMAS, the parliament's uh, approval. He appoints justices and judges upon the approval of SEMAS. Um, he appoints the commander of the army upon approval of SEMAS. He makes decisions concerning war in the event of an attack upon approval of the SEMAS. Again, that's just the parliament. Um, he's responsible for declaring a state of emergency, granting pardons to people, and granting citizenship to people based on the law. Um, he also signs the parliament's, Semas's laws, uh, and sends them back to parliament for further consideration. So that gives uh, the president some power over domestic matters, and that's why um, those kind of traditional slash conservative um, things that I mentioned at the very beginning matter, even if domestically the president doesn't have a lot of power under his jurisdiction. Um, but he does still have some power uh, because, again, he approves or rejects the laws and sends them back for further consideration. Um, and also, he is the face of the country of Lithuania. So he's the main figure. Um, and by this, by this fact, uh, people care what kind of a person the president is. Um, you want the face of your country to be somebody that you like, right? Uh, you don't want a jackass being the face of your country. So, you know, some of these uh, personality issues matter to people. Um, and also the president's kind of opinion 
or the issues he chooses to talk about the most are what influences the media. Um, so in that regard too, even if he's talking about things that don't lie in his jurisdiction, uh, it matters to people. So again, just reinforcing why some of these domestic issues like the LGBTQ, like the abortion rights, like the more traditional um, minded candidates like Miguel matter to people, even if it's not their primary jurisdiction. Um, and also, again, some people who don't follow politics super close in Lithuania may not necessarily know exactly what's under uh, president's jurisdiction or not. So they may be more likely to vote for um, vote for a candidate, even if it's not under, you know, because of an issue, even if it's not under their jurisdiction. Um, but this being said, I want to turn now to issues of foreign policy uh, in Lithuania. So, um, generally, all the candidates that I mentioned above, above Nociada, Shimonita, and Vegele, are all generally, generally, there is some variation, but generally they're all pro-EU and pro-Ukraine slash Pro bolstering uh, Lithuania's defense. Vigile is a little bit less fanatical about the EU than the others, but generally they all stand for the same thing. Um, and under Nociada, Lithuania has increased Lithuania's defense spending to 2.5% of their total GDP and is project and Lithuania is projected to make that 3% soon. Nociada also got Germany to permanently deploy a brigade to Lithuania. Um, now, obviously, the main concern with defense and military spending is Russia um, and to an extent Belarus. It's probably, you're, you know, if you're watching this video, Lithuania used to be part of the Soviet Union and only became free relatively recently um, in 91. So, obviously, with the Ukraine war, they want to ensure that the same thing doesn't happen to them. So, by bolstering their military spending, they can um, feel a little bit more safe. Um, okay. On this note, uh, I want to kind of shift gears uh, to pivot to two issues that I want to talk about that are involving Belarus and, to an extent, Russia. So the first is something called um, the instru the quote unquote instrumentalization of migration. Um, now all of the candidates have to an extent, again the candidates that I mentioned, have to an extent endorsed controlled or limits on migration. Nociada has said that Lithuania needs self-defense against this, instru this instrumentalization. And Shimonita has said that Lithuania needs quote unquote, controlled migrations. Um, Vigile uses slightly stronger language against refugees coming from Belarus and uh, Russia. Now, for those who don't know, the quote unquote, instrumentalization of migration is, rec is a recognized phenomenon by the EU. And according to um, the European Parliament website occurs when the Belarusian and the Russian government attract migrants to their country um, from places like Afghanistan, from Yemen and Syria, uh, only to force these migrants or encourage them to go to uh, countries like Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, etc. So, um, you know, it's, it's a weaponization because it's like bringing in migrants, but we're not going to deal with you. We're only going to send them to these other countries to put the burden on them. And we're not actually going to deal with any of them. Um, and obviously the fact that they're actively sending them to these countries, Lithuania, Poland, Latvia, um, is kind of a act of aggression. 
Um, now, again, according to this European Parliament website, um, but the main reason for Belarus doing this was in response to them being sanctioned by these countries after the rigged 2020 election and the repression of civil society in Belarus in 2021. Um, President of Belarus, Lukashenko, is a total uh, and utter dictator, and he has completely well, suppressed any kind of democratic rights. So, um, bad guy, bad guy. Um, now, and truthfully, I don't know how much this particular issue, the instrumentalization of um, migration, is likely to play a role in this upcoming election. But I think it seems very likely that this issue will continue to play a role in Lithuanian society and politics uh, down the road. So, especially it can be used as a, um, you know... Uh, a xenophobic kind of mobilization tactic because again there is some truth to it the influx of migration um and this can you know help uh use it as kind of ammo for any kind of xenophobic or anti-migrant rhetoric in the country again purely speculation if you're lithuanian and listening and you're like what he's saying is total bogus Please, in the comments section, annihilate me. Not only will that boost engagement, but it will also uh, help people who are watching it learn better. And when you do that, I will share it on my social media. So please do that. Um, okay. Now I'm going to move to the second point. And this issue is a little bit more complicated. And again, I'm going to be reading a lot. So uh, bear with me. So this issue is related and it concerns Belarusian migrants themselves. Um, so during Nosiada's first term, he was generally accepting of Belarusian migrants coming to Lithuania, um, including the Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Svikhanushka, uh, such that from 2020, the Belarusian population has increased from 17,000 people to 61,000 people and is 61,000 people in 2023 and it's projected to hit 100,000 uh, people at the current rate. Um, now, for a country of only 2.8 million, 100,000 is significant. Currently, uh, Belarus is the second most populous immigrant group in Lithuania, second only behind Ukraine, but it could increase to the first. Um, now, this migration of Belarus, Belarusians or Belarusians, however it's said, um, is not without problems. And it has sparked a debate in Lithuanian politics and society over whether or not uh, Lithuania should continue to accept Belarusian immigrants at the same rate or whether they should impose stricter quotas or limits. Um, in fact, in the lead up to this election, Noseada position has changed a little bit such that in 2023, he called for the same sanctions applied to potential Russian immigrants to be applied to Belarusian immigrants. Um, and in a poll in 2023 that was conducted, six out of 10 Lithuanians said that Lithuania needs stricter immigration, stricter immigration restrictions on Belarus or Belarusians. Um, okay. Now, why is this such a big issue? And why do I think this is important? Again, my opinion, not necessarily fact, but why do I believe this is a a big issue. Number one, uh, the fear of the kind of spread or um, an attempt to spread litvinism. Um, and for those of you who do not know, like I didn't know before this week, litvinism is a 
Belarusian ideology that essentially argues that Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, is basically a, they argue that Vilnius is basically a Belarusian city. And then most of Lithuania actually is Belarusian. Moreover, that the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which was the first, first Lithuanian state, plays an important role in Lithuanian's history um, and their culture, and was at its time either the largest or one of the largest states in Europe. They argue that the people of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania were really modern-day Belarusians. Um, so this is, poses a pretty big threat to the Lithuanian identity, um, this ideology, because it basically denies, uh, you know, the foundations for the Lithuanian state. So uh, fear of that could be one reason. Another reason could be the legacy of the Soviet Union, plus Belarusian, Belarus's connection to Russia now mainly, um, you know, the Belarusian regime, Lukashenko, is just a proxy for Putin, pretty much. Um, a, uh, you know, a brown nose for Putin, to put it that way. Um, now, obviously, this can be a concern because Lithuania is a population of 2.8 million, um, and it's not really going up. Uh, you know, Lithuania already had their language suppressed during Soviet times, during the Soviet Union. Um, and obviously there is a struggle to continue to um, promote the language, right? To, to build it back up um, after it was under attack for Ten for decades and decades uh, by the Soviet Union, to so there is there, there is you know a concerted effort to preserve it. Um, I did a side note. I did a podcast two years ago with two Lithuanians on Lithuanian music, and one of the things they said was that preserving the Lithuanian language is is kind of a big part of the music and society, and is a really important for Lithuanians. So having all these people coming in um, from a place that's very connected to Russia, where everybody speaks Russian, so you're hearing Russian all the time, um, you can see why that would spark, you know, backlash. People would be one super happy about that, right? This legacy of the Soviet Union, kind of this this attempt to Russify Lithuania, um, is obviously I think playing a role into why people are concerned with this influx of migration from Belarus, particularly as it pertains to Lithuanian society and, and culture. Um, and then the third reason I would say is the fear of Belarusian spies. Now, these are some passages from the OSW Center of, of uh, Eastern Studies, a Polish think tank, um, about that. So. I'm just going to read it. So they say, quote, Lithuania Special Services, including the State Security Department, VSD, responsible for civilian intelligence and counterintelligence, alerted politicians back in 2022 that the Belarusian migrants probably included people sent by Lukashenko's regime or Russian intelligence. According to the VSD, the activity of Belarusian intelligence agencies, such as the KGB, the GRU and the GUBOPIK, the latter of which was set up to fight the opposition, has reached a historically high level in Lithuania. They continue, one example of such infiltration is the case of Belarusian activist Olga Karach, uh, who has been living in Lithuania since 2014. In August 2023, Lithuanian Migration Services refused her asylum claim after the intelligence service accused her of maintaining contacts with Russian special services and providing them with information on the Belarusian opposition resident in Lithuania. Um, again, goes on to say, in late November 2022, 
Lithuania introduced a special procedure to screen Russian and Belarusian citizens, which has proved to be an effective tool for identifying undesirable persons on the country's territory. Um, by November 2023, um, 2,000 Russian and Belarusian citizens, including over 1,600 Belarusians, have been designated threats, have been, have been designated as threats to Lithuania's national security. Um, so that's interesting to me because, you know, not only is this claim like, oh, are Belarusian spies coming in among these migrants? Is this an attempt to um, actually pose a security threat to Lithuanian society? Um, now, you know, this could be viewed as conspiracy theory, but it actually, this article shows that, well, there's actually something to it, right? There are spies among the Belarusian population. Um, you know, there's number one, evidence of this person like Olga Karak, but there's also, you know, they've been catching uh, people, over 1,600 Belarusians who have been designated as threats to Lithuania's national security. That's not a little, that's a, that's a lot, right? Since November, 2023, um, or sorry, by November, 2023 in the year. It's pretty significant, pretty, pretty significant. Um, and I can imagine that would be likely to spark paranoia among citizens of Lithuania who are particularly concerned about the influx of Belarusian immigrants. Um, and again, it's also a related point. It's also likely to increase uh, the kind of um, sentiment towards restricting Belarusian immigration. Um, and then finally, this fourth factor could just be cultural differences. As I mentioned, this language barrier, um, the fact that they're all speaking Russian could pose a problem to, uh, you know, Lithuanian society and, and Lithuanians who, you know, have a memory of Soviet times. Um, and then also just, you know, again, cultural, psychological, political differences. Um, I'll give you an example. According to most surveys, Belarusians tend to be more skeptical of the EU. Now, obviously, Lithuania is moving closer towards the, the EU. So there's that dichotomy there. Um, and they tend to be a little bit closer toward Russia, more favorable toward um, establishing a closer relationship with Russia, which obviously Lithuania does not want to do. Most, most Lithuanians do not want to do. Um, now, finally, I'll just say, for what it's worth, I'm just speculating here. I don't know how much this will impact the current election, but I do imagine this will play a large role in Lithuanian politics down the line, and it will be interesting, um, again, if you're interested in Lithuanian politics or following the situation, to see how various politicians deal with it in Lithuania. Um, currently, the right in Lithuania has been particularly vocal about this issue, uh, particularly, tough name, uh, Lorinas Kasayunas, um, I probably botched that name, and Shimonita has been, um, has kind of played a middle ground on this issue. So the right has been particularly vocal, but Shimonita has tried to play a middle ground. Um, she's recognized that unrestricted Belarusian immigration is not good for the country uh, and that the current restrictive measures, i.e. the ones already in place, are sufficient to prevent quote-unquote bad Belarusians from coming in. Um, but Shimonita has also uh, recognized and acknowledged that 
Lithuanians do need these extra people um, and that it brings positive economic effects. The migration brings positive uh, economic effects to Lithuania, particularly in that they are filling the growing need for people in Lithuania's um, labor market. So, there you have it. That's my analysis of Lithuania's election. Again, I know everything wasn't super relevant to the election, but I thought these issues were relevant, sorry, were interesting um, and noteworthy to say. So that's that. Um, as I'll say always, please, if you're watching this and you're actually from Lithuania, uh, my friends especially, please share your own opinions, thoughts in the comment section. That'll be immensely helpful uh, to not just me, but to my audience. Um, and I will spread it around anonymously, of course, although the comments obviously won't be anonymous um, unless you create a fake name, which you can do. Um, but yeah, please share your thoughts. Please share, share any insights. Please tell me what I got wrong. Please tell me what you disagree with. Please tell me anything that I did get right and that you thought I nailed. Um, please tell me if I botched the, this pronunciation. And yeah, just give me your thoughts. I want to hear it. So that's that. Thank you guys for listening. Subscribe if you like this video. Um, and stay tuned for the next edition. Oh, and one more thing. Please uh, watch the Ukraine interview that I did with um, Kate Trofimova. Uh, it was really good, um, and if you don't want to watch two whole hours, please go to the playlist that I've uploaded from the episode where I am continuing to upload clips. Really, really recommend you listen to this video. Um, it's an incredible story about, uh, you know, Kate Tafimova's life growing up in Ukraine. It's got a lot of history involved in Ukraine. Um talks about her views on current Ukrainian politics. Zelensky talks about her opinions on Russians and the differences between Russian and Ukrainian. And it talks about her experience being in Kiev when the war started, trying to hide from the bombs, um, escaping Ukraine, psychological impact of that. It's really good, really personal, really emotional. Do not miss it. Yeah. That's it.